My dear brethren, this word Samaritan occurs at least in a few places in the New Testament, and I think it's important we know what this word means, uh, Samaritan, somebody who lives in the area of Palestine called Samaria. As a matter of fact, last Sunday we had the parable of the um, Good Samaritan who stopped and helped the dying man and the priest and the Levite passed by. Samaria, I'll try to illustrate this geographically, Samaria in, the, in Palestine is in between Judea, which is in the south, and that's where we get the word Jew from, Judea. And then just north of that is Samaria, and then north of that is Galilee. And both Samaria and Galilee were part of the northern kingdom. Uh, you remember after reading in your Bible history, after Solomon died, that it, the kingdom split into two permanently. It never was reunited, or at least not to the extent that it had been before. And anything north of Judea was called, that's where the ten tribes of Israel lived. And about seven centuries before Christ, the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom and just uh, permanently uh, destroyed it, you might say. And that's where we have the saying, the ten lost tribes of, of, of Israel. They never came back. They were never able to come back in their full integrity. When they were carried off by the Assyrians, they intermingled, intermarried, and so some of them came back eventually and settled in that northern area called Samaria. But, and make no mistake about this, they were basically heretics. They had split off from the true chosen people who were down in the south. Now, remember, they got carried off also, but they came back and retained their integrity as a race. They didn't lose that like the whole northern kingdom did. But the Samaritans didn't accept the same books of the Old Testament. They violated a most sacred ordinance by building their own temple on Mount Gerizim, they had their own law, and they were heretics. They were schismatics from the true chosen people. And there was a lot of antipathy between the Judeans and the Samarians. The Judeans, of course, were faithful as a people to the covenant, but the Samaritans were not. And What's interesting also is when people traveled from Judea, and of course this is only by, you know, riding on a donkey or walking. You know, remember there's no cars back then. But anyway, anytime they went from Judea to Galilee, they had to pass through Samaria. And a good Jew who looked down on these Samaritans would not even look at that abomination of a temple up there in Mount Gerizim because that was not pleasing to God. They were supposed to worship only at the temple or have that as the place of worship, the temple in Jerusalem. So this is the relationship, you might say, that was there between the Judeans and the Samaritans. It was not a good relationship. And yet... And yet, our Lord points out that even these people that weren't part of the chosen race, even they were capable of doing things that sometimes the Judeans themselves did not do. After all, who was it that stopped and helped the dying man? As we read in last Sunday's Gospel, you would think the priest and the Levite, especially, they, you know, they, they knew the law well. 
and we don't know why they passed by. But isn't it a tragedy of the worst kind to know that somebody looks like he's dead or, or close to dying or just in a bad way and just, I don't even want to look. It was the Samaritan, the heretic, that stopped to give that life assisting work of charity. Our Lord is not condoning the Samaritans. He's not saying they're a true religion. But he, what he was saying is if even these people can do an act of charity like that, how much more you? And to this day, we have that phrase, a good Samaritan, somebody who sees somebody in a definite need and is able to help and does help. Today's gospel tells us that our Lord cured ten lepers. Now, how bad is leprosy? Let me put it to you pretty bluntly here. Leprosy, unchecked, is a disease where your body rots away until you die. Fortunately, we, fought, we have antibiotics and treatments today where that, does, that can be greatly arrested or slowed down, that, that, uh, that particular disease. But back 2,000 years ago, there was no cure. As a matter of fact, because they thought it was contagious, once you acquired leprosy, you were cut off from all of society, even your friends, even your family. Can you imagine that? You see why people were so terrified of, of uh, seeing signs of leprosy. And they, they, they could only function in society if, if, if they were able to somehow be cured from it or if it maybe was just a skin condition, but the priests had it as their job. They had to certify that, in fact, it was not leprosy for them to be able to continue to live in society and with their family. But once the determination was made, you have leprosy, you are cut off permanently till you die. And then you can only depend on people's charity. And people would not come up close to you. Again, they, they feared getting you know, the, uh, leprosy by contagion. You'd have maybe some coins thrown at you, some morsels of food. What a way to live. You could even say that a leper basically was in a state of living death until he or she actually died. So, ten lepers, ten living a living death, so to speak. Jesus, have pity on me. And we know that one of them was the Samaritan. And Jesus doesn't cure them right there, but he does what the law indicates. You have to prove to the priest that you do not have leprosy. And as they're walking to the priests to be certified that they're free of this loathsome disease, it disappears. They were rescued from a living death. And yet, how many came back to say thank you? Was it all ten? Was it seven? Was it five? Or was it only one? And again, he wasn't even one of the chosen people. He was the heretic. And our Lord is saying, if the heretic can come and say thank you, even more should you be able to say thank you. So what a powerful lesson. What a sad commentary on the human condition that we can receive the greatest gifts from God and fail to say thank you. Our lives should, should really be filled with thank you. We should live a life of gratitude because how can you even begin to write down on paper everything God has done for you? How can you thank him for every breath that you took during your sleep last night? And what would have happened if you had stopped breathing? You wouldn't be here this morning, nor would I. 
How many times did your heart beat last night while you were sleeping? Again, we just take things for 